Who was Cleisthenes? And what did he do during his lifetime for his name to be remembered among those of the greatest Greeks and the most influential figures in human history? Considered by historians to be the true father of classic Greek democracy, Cleisthenes was born in the year 570 BCE. He was the son of Megacles, the leader of the party of the coastmen during the years of Solon, and an opponent and sometimes ally of Pisistratus, the infamous Greek tyrant who ruled Athens from 546 BCE until his death in 527 BCE, and who passed on his tyrannical powers to his sons who ruled until the year 510 BCE until they were finally defeated at the hands of Cleisthenes. I'm General Elias, and this is Historicity, a channel in which we keep a record of the constant call time, the good and the bad, in hopes of learning to not repeat the mistakes of the past. Little is known about his early life, but we do know that in 546 BCE, his father, Megacles, and his clan, the Alcmeonids, including a 25-year-old Cleisthenes, were expelled from Attica by Pisistratus for 20 years. It is believed that after Pisistratus died in the year 527 BCE, his son Hippias tried to consolidate his power by welcoming back those nobles that had been expelled by his father, among them Cleisthenes and his clan. But of his father, Megacles, nothing more is ever heard of, making it quite possible that he died in his years in exile. Upon his return to Athens and public life, Cleisthenes managed to climb the social ranks in less than a year and became chief archon by the year 526 BCE with the favor of his new king. Having this type of influence after returning from exile shows three things. Number one, the resourcefulness of Cleisthenes as an individual. Number two, the influence of his people, the Alcmeonids. And number three, the sheer number of loyal followers that the men of the coast what could be called the political party or faction established by his father in the times of Solon, still had in ancient Athens. Over time, however, the alliance with the tyrant wore out, and in 514 BCE, after the gruesome murder of his brother Hipparchus in a public festival, Hippias became increasingly repressive and tyrannical towards the population of Athens, including Cleisthenes, who was actually sent back again into exile. But this time around, we do know where he actually went. He visited Sparta, where he claimed to have the support of the oracle at Delphi, and convinced the Spartans to help him remove the tyrant Hippias off of the Athenian throne. With the help of Cleomenes I of Sparta, Cleisthenes marched into Athens in the year 510 BCE and trapped Hippias in the Acropolis. In order for him to guarantee that Hippias would abandon power and not turn around, regain his forces and attack again, Cleisthenes and the Spartans held the children of his entire family, all the descendants of Pisistratus, hostage until he had left Attica, until Hippias had actually fled. He fled to Persia, and only then did they agree to release the children. After Hippias' removal, Cleisthenes competed for power in Athens against a new rival, Isagoras, an Athenian aristocrat who would eventually gain the support of the majority and would beat Cleisthenes at becoming chief archon of Athens in 508 BCE. But how is it possible that not being chief archon, a position that could be equated to being president or prime minister, Cleisthenes managed and is credited with creating democracy in 508 BCE. <laughs> well, it so happens that after losing the archonship, Cleisthenes promised the poor of Athens the majority, progressive reforms that Isagoras was unwilling to commit to. And after gaining the support of the majority, Cleisthenes and his supporters became a serious threat to Isagoras' government. Instead of dealing with a strong opposition, which of course would have made uh, governing a bit more difficult, Isagoras tried to take a page out of Cleisthenes' uh, very own playbook. First, he approached the Spartan king, Cleomenes I, 
and ask for his support in expelling Cleisthenes and his supporters out of Athens, a group that amounted to being close to 600 people and their families. Cleisthenes, recognizing the danger to his life, prudently left Athens at the Spartan approach and exiled himself for the third time in his life. But the population of Athens wasn't having it. When Isagoras tried to dissolve the bull, the council of 400 Athenians in charge of running the city's daily affairs, the equivalent to our Congress or Parliament, uh, the population of Athens had enough. They rose against the invaders and their own elected archon, trapped them in, uh, for two days in the Acropolis, and finally, on the third day, agreed to let the leaders, Isagoras and the Spartan king Cleomenes I, to secretly escape before murdering their 200 soldiers and followers. In this political void, though, knowing that they had enraged the Spartans, who quite possibly would soon gather back their soldiers and attack Athens again with even mightier force, according to Herodotus, the Athenians sent an envoy to Persia asking for their support. The envoy arrived at Sardis and spoke to Artaphrenes, viceroy of Asia Minor and brother of King Darius the Great, the leader of the Persian Empire. Artaphrenes didn't even know who the Athenians were or where to find Athens. But since the Persian Empire at the time was such a powerful empire that many nations flocked to it looking for military support and help, he asked them for what was customary at the time, submission to Persian rule. He asked them for water and earth. In essence, he was asking the Athenian envoys to submit their land and resources, uh, Athens, to Persian rule. If they were not willing to give this, uh, there would be no assistance, and they, they were to go back home empty-handed. The envoys, not considering their actions and without consulting the citizens of Athens, made the gesture and gave King Darius water and earth. Upon their return to Athens, the people were not satisfied with the outcome. These were people who did not believe in having kings. They believed in the equality of all human beings, especially the citizens of Athens. They would have never consented to becoming the subjects of anyone, especially a Persian ruler, uh, who, after the agreement, uh, believing himself uh, the lore of Athens already, immediately made a demand of Athenians their return to power of Hippias, the man they, they had just gotten rid of two years earlier, the last tyrant uh, to rule over Athens and son of Pisistratus. After these events, afraid and disillusioned, the people of Athens asked Cleisthenes to return again from his exile and name him chief archon. Obviously, without uh, a strong opposition to his rule, he was able to implement those reforms he had promised the poor and desperate of Athens, in essence, giving them real, untether equality, in essence providing them for the first time with a real democracy. But what were the reforms he implemented in order for him to create a real democracy in Athens? He created a convoluted and original system like never before. And although much is not known about his life, the fact that he was able to come up with this type of complex organizational pattern in order for him to arrive at equality goes to prove his genius and the fact that he was incredibly well versed in management, political theory before there was ever political theory, psychology before that was even a field, arithmetic, statistics, and city planning. First, he redefined the basic structure of the Athenian government and separated uh, Athenian society by a place of residence rather than the family a person belonged to. You see, before Cleisthenes' reforms, there were four different and powerful clans in Athens, the clans or classes created by Solon based on wealth. And in order for you to be part of one of those clans, you had to be born into it or have a family relation to it somehow. These bred the increasing and never-ending tribal conflicts that contributed to the city-state's instability especially when you consider the fact that the fourth clan, or class, the lower class, the poor, although having the power to vote, could not hold public office. Instead of those four clans, Cleisthenes divided Attica, a region of more or less 1,000 square miles, 
into three different regions, the coastal, the hills, and the inland region. Each region in turn was divided into 10 triads or thirds. So now Attica ended up with 30 different triads. Each triad was composed of one to four deems or suburbs, which were constructed based on where someone lived. You see, Cleisthenes was the first person to create the concept of a neighborhood. He didn't want the people of Athens to just hold loyalty to their family members and clans, which would have them fighting for control of the city based on old quarrels and all fights and wrongs that had been committed uh, from one family to another uh, over thousands of years. He wanted them to fight together against the common ills of their society so that they could better their own lives and those of the people around them. So although, for example, you and your next door neighbor, let's call him Aristarchus, were members of a different clan and family, which would have you fighting and quite likely opposed to one another before Cleisthenes. Now, under his new directives, you were members of the same deem, the same demos, the same people. You were members of the same group. And so, instead of fighting and opposing one another, you would be more likely to cross the fence and work with each other for the bettering of your neighborhood and Attica and the bettering of Athens as a whole. There were around 139 deems at first. Now, and here's the magic of the whole system, Cleisthenes devised. He also created 10 new tribes. Each tribe was composed of three triads, one belonging to each region. So every single tribe in Attica represented even segments of Attica's population. Each tribe now, instead of being represented or representing a group of similar people, represented the hillmen, the coastmen, and the men of the inland, the rich, the middle class, and the poor. Now, just as the deem eliminated clan loyalty, the new 10 tribes, since they were composed of members of each region, eliminated economic differences and distributed power equally among social classes. Now, the members of all economic levels, whether you live in the hills, whether you live in the coast, or whether you lived inland, were members of the same tribe and had to work together to represent and better their deems, and in the end, better Athens. Cleisthenes also changed the size of the bull, or city council, and increased the number of council members from 400 to 500, so that each tribe could then send 50 men to represent the council, um, where everyone could actually speak freely and openly. And that's how decisions in Athens started being made for the next 200 years, until the days of Philip of Macedon and Alexander the Great. In order for him to make these changes actually stick, Cleisthenes even went as far as demanding that the people of Attica start using not patriarchal-based names such as Cleisthenes, son of Megacles, but deem-based names such as Cleisthenes of Marathon and Cleisthenes of Delphi. Even in your voting ostracon, your voting registry or ballot, you would write down your name, your father's name, and the name of your deem to identify yourself. Uh, there were two reasons for this. One, if a person used the deem in their name, it would make him identify more with his deem. And two, it also prevented Athenians from being prejudiced toward a particular family just because of their ancestry. Uh, because, for example, if Aristarchus, son of Phineas, is talking at the council, I might feel inclined to vote for his proposal because I owed his father a favor. But instead, if he is only known as Aristarchus of Delphi, I might just weigh his proposal based on its merits and forget altogether what the family he came from, which was very popular in antiquity. He also established isonomia, the principle that all male citizens, no matter the standing, no matter where he came from, had equal rights under the law, and incorporated sortition, the random selection of citizens to feel uh, government positions instead of it being based on family and heredity. So he destroyed a system that, although well intended as the one that had been created by Solon, was rather imperfect and prone to falling into the hands of tyrants and redistributed power uh, equally to each man within the city-state. Based on the fear of tyrants, since he himself 
was the man responsible for deposing the last one, it is believed that he also created the principle of ostracism, the political tool by which a council could exile someone deemed too dangerous or powerful for 10 years. A principle which uh, would not be used too often, but the threat of which would keep overambitious politicians and military leaders in check for centuries. Of his later life, not much is known. He disappears of the historical record after his major reforms in the years 508 and 507 BCE. But those reforms, those changes, those ideas he brought about and incorporated into Athenian government would live forever. And just like Solon before him and Pericles after him, he would become a pillar of democracy across the world. He would become the father of classical Greek democracy. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the like button and click the bell so that every time there's a new video, you can be immediately informed. Also, come on, subscribe if you haven't already. I'm General Elias, and this is history.